be the very, very brief, um, you know, background into who we are, what we do. Uh, my name's Drew Edwards. This is my dad, Terry Edwards. Hi, folks. We're from a company called Make More Placements. And what we do is we work with recruitment and search business owners and, you know, essentially help them make more placements uh, for higher fees with less work and fewer headaches. It's primarily by focusing on three main things. One, helping you have more um, conversations with interested, interested hiring managers or hiring leaders in your market. So more basically sales meetings or sales calls. Two, we help you convert more of those sales meetings into clients who pay the right fee and on the right terms. And three, we help you build systems and processes to do both of those two things without it sucking time and energy away from you as, as a business owner. So that's sort of the, like, like the brief overview of what we do. Um, what I like to do in these calls, though, if you, if you um, two things, if you want to, one, find out more about what we do, and you want to sort of continue this conversation after this training, or two, you just want the recording of the, of, of the webinar, um, the training that we're doing here, the best place to get it is by joining um, our Facebook group if you're not already a member. So I'm just going to drop the link in the chat box for you there so it's just uh, facebook.com slash group slash make more placements or if you search the make more placements community on there one you can you know connect with us on facebook two you can get the recording of this training as well so if it's your first time um someone said what is kajabi i don't know the relevance of that i, I mean i tell you what I'll, i know who that is i'll answer that separately that's got nothing to do with this call though okay cool. you know. um yeah if you want to talk to your conversation head over to facebook and join there um but for now let's just jump right in Welcome to the training, how to win more exclusive or retained assignments uh, starting next month. Um, so first of all, you know, welcome, you know, new and old, good to have you here. Thank you for taking the time out of the day to join us. The reason we decided to put on this training is like I think a few weeks ago, we done a survey on LinkedIn and on Facebook and we asked the question, you know, what, what's your preference in terms of terms, what terms do you like to work, work under when, when working with clients? And we gave the options of contingency, um, exclusive or retained, and the vast majority of people said, um, you know, they prefer to work on exclusive or retained. But there's another there's a problem was that, that a lot, although that was the preference, um, a lot of people were finding it hard to convince their their clients to, to go down that route because, um, you know, what they wanted is they wanted to work on contingency, where the client from the client's viewpoint there was there was little risk, um, and they didn't really see the benefit of moving across to exclusive or retained. So this is it, this is really a training for you if you fall into that category. So either you're currently doing contingency, but you want to win more exclusive or retained, or you're doing, you know, exclusive or retained, but you want more of them and you're finding that you're losing out on business to contingency recruiters. This is what, that's what we're going to be really be covering today. Um, again, if you're completely new to the concept and you perhaps just joined this up out of curiosity, like one of the, the big reasons sort of me and Terry are, um, are really big on you know our preferred method like what we everyone we work with we, we heavily push them to go down the exclusive with cancellation or the retained route for I mean for lots of reasons but like one I think you know it, it blocks competition I think um in the in the environment that we're in now a few years back you could get away with contingency and be fine but with more and more recruiters entering the market what what happens is like you're Often, rather than like before, where it was maybe you competing with another one of the agency to fill a vacancy, now it's you know three, four, five, you know, multiple agencies, and fill rates are really, really dropping. So, the reason we're so big on exclusive and retained, so you can secure, um, you know, block the competition and really increase your your fill rates. Less work, fewer money. I mean, if you've got higher fill rates, rather than working on ten job orders just to fill one, you can work on one just to fill one, right? For example, so it's significantly less work for the same amount of money or more money. Um, it, it gives the better service to your clients, and we'll speak more about that today. Um, but yeah, I, I think sort of as a caveat for that, when we say exclusive, we're talking about exclusive with a cancellation, meaning that if the client pulls the plug, changes their mind, um, you're still entitled to some form of payment. And this, I think if you if you're working exclusively with clients, but there's no, uh, I guess, consequence for the client breaking that exclusivity, it's not really exclusive. Terry, there's two things. I want to check in. Does that make sense? Give me a yes or no in the chat box. And Terry. Anything you'd, you'd add to that? Yeah, the there's a couple of things going on right now because of this pandemic. A lot of a lot of recruiters have laid off and and got rid of a lot of consultants. The consequence of which is a lot of consultants out there who've now made a decision 
I'm going to set up my own business. You know, and I know, it doesn't take much to do that. You just need a computer and a telephone um, and you can literally set up a business the next day. Now, these new guys that come into the market um, are kind of going for the contingent uh, model. So calling hiring managers saying, have you got any job orders? Yeah, great, well, let me work on it. The consequence for you is that you've got more competition. Consequence for you, if you're working as a contingent recruiter, the average contingent recruiter will fill between 10 to 40% of the roles they work on. Let me repeat that, 10 to 40% of the roles they will fill. A couple of the interesting points here. Most, recruit, most recruitment and search business owners don't actually know what their number is. Word of caution, you ought to know that number. But what it does mean is that most of the time you're working, you're not getting paid. Now, if Drew and I would say, so you come and work for us, and 50, 60, 70, 80, 90% of the time, when you work for us, you're not gonna get paid, I kind of can guess your response. You would say that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Why on earth would you do that with a hiring manager? And you know, get a job order along with five other recruiters, at best your chances there are 20% of filling that role. If the, if, the, if the four of the recruits, five of the recruiters rather, got it before you, it probably isn't even as high as 20%. So why would you do that? So this is all about working and getting paid for the work that you do. That's all we're recommending. Um, just type yes in the box if that seems fair, that any work that you do, you're going to get paid for. Just type yes in the box. If you don't think it's fair, let, let me know and we'll have a conversation. So just let me know if, if you think that's fair, that any work that you do, heck yes, um, uh, you, you're going to get paid for. Awesome. So that's all. What, what we want to do today is share with you how whatever work you do, you get paid for. No more, no less. How many times have you worked in the contingent role and worked your butt off only for the client to ghost you? And to this day, and I've experienced it as well, you, you still don't know what's going on. Or the client calls you a few weeks later saying, oh, I'm sorry, we filled that role internally. Despite all the work that you did, you did all that work, you got nothing for it. And if as a contingent recruiter, like most contingent re recruiters, you're not filling most of the roles, from the hiring manager's point of view, they're thinking, most of the roles I give the recruiters, they don't fill anyway. So the perception is that you're not doing a very good job because most of the roles you get, you don't fill. Back to you, Drew. Awesome. So just very quickly, here's what we're going to cover today. Number one, um, we're going to go over why most recruitment and search business owners approach to business development is actively working against you winning retained or exclusive clients. And, and I'm going to look at, you know, what you need to be doing instead. Um, we're going to be talking about, you know, I guess a secret sales strategy that Starbucks used to convert 97% of prospects into buyers and how to apply it into your recruitment business. So this means that, you know, we're going to show you how to ensure that more of the conversations, the sales meetings that you have right now with prospects, with potential clients are ending in you uh, winning that exclusive or, or, or retained assignment for the fee you want. Um, and we're going to be looking at how to, you know, what to tell your clients during your next sales meeting to ensure that they want to work with you on a retained or exclusive basis. And this is without you feeling, without, without them feeling like they're missing out because they're not working with, with multiple other, other firms. I think that's one of the, the big roadblocks here. We need to get across to the client why it's good for them. Before we sort of dive... I just, can I just add to that as well? Uh, also, one of the benefits of doing this, if, you, if you've got any discomfort about selling of any kind, You've got to listen to this because what we're going to share with you is a situation whereby the client's going to want to buy from you more than you want to sell to them. We're going to actually say to you, don't do the hard sell. There's a way that you can get business on a retained basis without, you know, the foot in the door and your knees on the client's chest, you know, trying to persuade them to, 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 to buy from you. It, the client doesn't like it and a lot of people don't like doing it. So don't do it. We're going to share with you exactly what to do instead to get you the results. To be fair, though, uh, uh, this isn't for everybody. We're going to be up front uh, right, right now. So we'll just give you a bit of a disclaimer. This is not going to work for you if you're not prepared to step outside your comfort zone. Because wherever you are now, it's just merely a reflection of the, of the comfort zone that you're working in. For you to, 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 to achieve more, you're going to have to step outside your comfort zone, which is, of course, going to create some discomfort. So if you're not prepared to do that, I'd say I'd leave now, quite frankly, because it's not going to work. If you keep doing what you're doing now, you're going to get the results that you're getting now. If you're not prepared to change what you're currently doing now for better results, I was talking to somebody this morning and he said, yeah, but I've always done it this way. I said, yeah, I get you've been always doing it that way. You've been doing it that way now for the last seven years and your business hasn't grown for the last seven years. Well, that's not going to work. Well-known fact that psychologists discovered there's, there's two types of mindsets. There's closed mindset and growth mindset. So growth mindset, they kind of open the mind to anything. And they say things like, I don't know how to do this yet. Closed mindset say, this can't be done. 
for this to work, you need a growth mindset. You need to open your mind to the realms of possibility that if another recruiter can do this, and there are millions of recruiters right now, you want to think about this. There are million recruiters around the world right now who only work on a retained basis. Now, if there's one or two, you think, well, maybe they're lucky. But the fact there are some recruitment and search firms who only work on a retained basis. If they can, so can you. We used to work with a guy uh, based in Canada who had something like 18 months experience in recruitment and he worked for the sister. And he, between the two of them, they should do just under a million a year Canadian dollars. But he was taught how to do retained recruitment, retained recruitment. So you've got to have that open mind. Hey, listen, if you've got your phone on, you've got your computer on, you're going through Facebook and LinkedIn, well, good luck with that. But to get the maximum benefit for this, we, we need your 100% attention. So please be, be fully engaged with us. Well, some really bad news for you as well. We're not going to sell you anything. So if you come here with your credit card ready to buy something, else, we've got nothing to sell you. We just want to give as much value as possible. So put your credit card away. Um, at the end, we'll take any questions as we go along, by the way, if you, if we say anything, you think I disagree, don't understand, just post it, in the, post it in the chat box there and we will respond. And for those guys, a percent of you that are on this call are here because you're really serious about growing your business. If that's the case, we can have a, another conversation offline. You can have a conversation with one on our team and we can go to specific details about your business. So they're the disclaimers. Anything to add to that, Drew? Yeah, to, I guess to, like, we'll, while we're on the line, we'll give you everything we've got. Like, just ask questions. We're happy to answer. One sort of commitment that I want from you, though, is, you know, we've, we've got about 45 minutes together from now, you know, plus Q&A at the end, right? For 45 minutes, I want you to be fully committed, fully engaged. Um, pay attention, ask questions. Like, yeah, yeah, be, just be engaged. Like, I hate when people come on to these things and they, you know, they're doing them. And I know what it can be like, but you're not going to get anything out of it if that's that you, you're coming in with so if you're not fully focused and you know just just leave now um but if you are going to be fully focused i want you fully engaged fully participating second thing is you know as terry said if you find this useful again if you don't you think we, we talk absolute nonsense and find we'll part way as friends if you do find it useful um commit to yourself that you know we we're going to give you like the ten thousand foot view of how to do this but commit to yourself that you'll you'll reach out to us to speak with us personally for a more personalized look at how it would, would work in your business um, again if you if you agree to that just give me a yes in the chat box i do want to hear from all of you um if not then you, again you're free to leave i won't take any offense to it but let me know if you agree to that just give me a yes in the chat box perfect and again if not no hard feelings um no it can be like just leave now i don't want people who are sort of fully committed to taking this in and making making it work in their business awesome Awesome, good to hear lots of yeses. Drew, really good name, by the way. Awesome. Obviously, very, inte very intelligent uh, parents. Uh, that's, that kind of guess what I say. <laughs> At least one of them was intelligent, but anyway. <laughs> awesome. So look, let's, let's dive in. So the first thing I really want to look at um, is the business development side of things. I think sometimes, again, just speaking to our clients and speaking to people in the industry, um, one of the sort of I guess mistakes people make is when especially when they're so this is people that, that, that are old school you know OGs that selling retained but all, even the ones who are moving from continuity to do retain they they think it's all about what they say and do during the sales meeting with the prospect and obviously that is very very important a lot of the trainings talk about you know what to say in, in, the, in the sales call but I think I want to look, take it back a step or a couple of steps really and look at the business development from because from what I see the way that you may be approaching business development now, the way that you market your business could be directly, um, I guess, contradicting or working against you winning exclusive or, or, or retained work. So I want to take a look at that first, right? So the first thing I want to sort of talk about is something that's very important is, 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 is what is a good lead or a good prospect for retained versus a good prospect for contingency. Because there's a shift that needs to be made there. The way you approach them is completely different. Um, what they're interested in is completely different and, and the timing of when you approach them is completely different. So what I mean by that is a mistake that, that a lot of recruiters make is they're going after people who are, you know, all their business development is aimed at people who, are, who have a vacancy, right? So they hit the job boards, they look for who's got vacancies and they'll put them into their CRM and, and, try and try and win business out of them. They'll send NPCs, which obviously, you know, the premise is like, are you interested in this person? Are you hiring now? All of the messages, 
all of the, the effort is going after people who have a vacancy, which, you know, at one level makes sense. If you've got a vacancy, they're more likely to buy now. But there's a shift that needs to happen for exclusive or retained because you basically, like, if they're already hiring, if the prospect's already hiring, you're too late. We want to get to the prospect before they've pulled the trigger, before they've started the hiring process. If they've started hiring, even if you're quick, like other recruiters are going to do the same thing, right? If, if you see a, you see a job post, see there's this vacancy, you know, you're not going to be the only recruiter to approach them. So we need to sort of get to them and build the relationship, start that sales process before they even post the vacancy. Just want to check in. Does that make sense? Give me a yes or no in the chat box. And Terry, anything you'd add to that? Yeah, because it's really tempting when you speak to a hiring manager and you say to a hiring manager, are you recruited? And the hiring manager says, yes, I am. And you think, happy days, I've just won some business. You haven't won any business, you've just identified a hiring manager that's recruited. There's a massive difference between the two. And if the hiring manager's already recruited, as Drew said, they've probably got that job on job boards, they've probably uh, given that to half a dozen of your competitors already. Probably gave it to your competitors two or three weeks ago, so they've got a massive head start on you. What you want to be finding is what's called the future buyers. You, you want to be talking, uh, reaching out to a hiring manager that's going to be recruited in the next 30 days, the next 60 days. Hell, the next six months. If you spoke to a hiring manager and they said, yeah, we are the, in the six months' time, we want to bring in an XYZ, that's what you want to be celebrating. Because now you're in with a chance of getting this on the retained or exclusive basis. But if the hiring manager's already given it to half a dozen of your competitors, you're trying to get in it exclusively, well... <laughs> Good luck with that. Just a full uh, disclaimer. We should put this in disclaimer. Uh, Drew's handwriting is atrocious and his drawings are even worse. So just for those that are thinking, what the hell's he written there? Well, I, I will translate it as we go along, yeah? So what he's drawn there, believe it or not, is a triangle. And what he's identifying is there's two types of buyers. There's the now buyers, which is about 5% of the market, they're, they're in they're, they're with the recruiter right now or they're looking for somebody right now and there's the future buyers which is about 95 percent of the market and, and again just to be clear i've made those percentages up i don't know what it would be for your market your sector but you know I, we can all agree that there's, there's probably more people that are going to be hiring in, in, in the future versus who are hiring now right so the, the point i wanted to really illustrate is what we have is you know um got, let's say it's five percent now buyers and then 95 percent people are going to be hiring in the future what ma the majority the vast majority of recruiters do they're saying 95 percent of the market what they're doing is going after this small segment here so they've got 95 percent of the market for, again i don't know exact numbers but for example going after five percent of the market at any given time which as you can imagine creates more competition um means it's, it's, it means everything's difficult Every, everything's harder right there's less chance of you winning the sale less chance of you even booking the meeting Less chance of you winning exclusive or retained because, you know, yes, you might get through to the hiring manager or decision maker at the right time, but they're going to have three other calls from other recruiters the same day or emails or NPCs or, you know, all the things that you're doing, other recruiters doing the same thing, right? So it doesn't matter how many, how good uh, you are on the phone, how many, what, what script you use, how good you are at email, LinkedIn, all, any of that stuff, none of that stuff, like, matters um, if you're going after this group because it's where all the competition is, right? But here, we've only got like maybe 5% of the market going after this 95%. This is where you need to switch your focus. So we're not going after people who are hiring now. We're going after the majority who are hiring in the future, looking to build the relationship with them. And the, the, the ultimate goal here, the ultimate goal here is that when they have a need, we are the first person they think of, first people they, they, they think of, right? Because if, if that's the case, before they've publicly announced or publicly demonstrated that they're hiring, they're reaching out to us or we reached out to them because we've already got the call scheduled. And we're saying, okay, look, if, you, if you're looking to hire this type of candidate, here's how we can help, right? So when check in, does that make sense? You want to shift with who you, all your market messages go after, not people who are hiring now, but people who are hiring in the future. Does that make sense? Give me a, a, a yes or no in the chat box. And Terry, anything you'd add to that? Not this stage, Drew, not at this stage. So we're, we're looking for the, uh, the future buyers is, is who we're looking for. Okay, just give me yes and no in the chat. So what, what this gives us, which is critical here when it comes to your, your whole sales psychology, it gives us uh, the opportunity to book more sales meetings because we're not just going after these people. So let me highlight this. We're not just going after these people here. We're now going after these people. 
and there's obviously more people here. So we can book more sales meetings. So if you look at your business development, right, one of the one of the key metrics to tell whether your business development is, is working is how many sales meetings you book in the next 30 days. Right? If you can if you can increase that next month or the month after, your business will grow, right? All things being equal, you'll make more sales. It's just it, there's no, I think sometimes people overcomplicate what business development is. And there's so much talk about automation and all this other stuff. The, the, the key metric is how many sales meetings am I booking? With the recruiters that we speak to, a lot of them only booking sort of between six and 10 per month. A big reason for that is because they're going after this 5% where there's heavy competition and the six, the, 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 the six and 10 that they're speaking to, they're speaking to other people as well. If we can shift that and get you to 20 to 30 sales meetings per month, because we're going after people who, just as a caveat, the sales meetings might not lead to business that month. But we're building future pipeline. We're building relationships and building future pipeline for people who are hiring next month, the month after, the month after, right? We increase the volume. When you increase the volume, like one of the biggest psychological, um, I, I guess, influences in you winning the business you want is your ability to walk away, your ability to say no and turn down business. Less opportunities, less sales meetings. Let's say you've got, let's say you have five sales meetings next month. You want to win more retained and exclusive. Um, assignments, but every the five people you speak to, they're, they're giving you pushback. They're giving you objections, right? Because you've only got five sales meetings and you're sort of worried about paying your bills, paying your overhead, paying your staff, whatever, you feel like you have to accept one or all of them. When you have more sales meetings in your calendar, you can be picky about who you work with. You can say no to five because you know you've got number 15 to come next week. Someone check in, does that make sense? Give me a yes or no. In the, in the chat box and Terry, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, so what we're talking about here is what's called abundance mindset or scarcity mindset. So you imagine the, the ocean is, is, is your potential clients. With scarcity mindset, uh, you know, recruiters run down, to the, run down to the beach with two thimbles um, and, and scoop up you know, what they see as potential there and gingerly walk back, fearful of, drop, of, of, of dropping a thing. The abundance mindset go, hell, there's more business out there that you can handle. And by the way, think about that for a minute. This is a fact. There is more business out there right now than most uh, uh, independent search firms can handle on a retained basis. Most re independent search firms, if you get 24 new clients in a year uh, on a retained basis, you're delighted. You're absolutely delighted. And there's more than that out there. So abundance mindset, you, you run down to the beach now, you've got two massive pails. And you, and you run back up, you spill a bit, but it's like, hey, it's okay. Because the moment you've got that mindset, that abundance mindset, and the moment that you've got the situation where there's more business out there, what it means is you're going to decide who you're going to work with rather than the hiring managers deciding whether they're going to work for you, work with you. And when you make that decision and you're deciding who you're going to work with, you're going to make the best decision for you and your business. If the client's making the decision as to who they're going to work with, their intentions won't probably be the best for you. It's going to be all about them. And that's a massive mindset set when shift rather, when you get that. And it, it is it is to do with your thinking where you get where you acknowledge there is more business out there than, than, than you can handle. At the peak of the pandemic, uh, you know, April last year, um, and we we got together with our clients and you know, people were going, what the hell are we going to do? And there was this this fear out there about what's going to happen to the market. Here's a fact. At the peak of the pandemic, on LinkedIn, there were 840,000 job vacancies. Let me repeat. Worldwide, there were 840,000 job vacancies. That's nearly a million job vacancies. How many of those do you actually need on a retained basis to have a highly successful uh, business? So, it, yes, things were tighter during the pandemic, but there was still an abundance of business out there, and you've got to behave accordingly. And yeah, again, just on that, Terry, even though things were tighter during the pandemic, what you what we saw is we saw this bit of the market get smaller. The now yeah, not, that's right. It actually got bigger, obviously. That's right. So if you were at that time going after the now buyers, it looked really bad, right? Because it, it was getting smaller. But if you if you instead were going after the future buyers, we know I mean, again, we can say now with certainty, I guess people didn't really know, but you could guess at the time that okay, they're not hiring now, but they probably will be next year um, or the back end of 2020, they're, they're probably going to be hiring. How about I market to those people now, look to build relationships. So when that time comes, I'm at the forefront of their mind. That's that's what the shift is really about. And someone's asked, um, well, Drew's asked actually, the other Drew has said, um, yeah, that would make sense, but how do you find them? 
that's the best bit about this. It's not difficult. It's, it's difficult to find the nail biters because there's less of them. You can pretty much assume that the majority of your market are future buyers, even if they are now by and you, like they're gonna, they're still a future buyer really because you may not work on that vacancy they've got now, but you're still looking to build relationship for the future. So it's not really about how to find them. Like, look on LinkedIn, every single one of nearly no ninety five percent of people on LinkedIn right now will fall into the category of future buyers. Finding them is not the difficult thing. It's more about changing your messaging and your intent to that messaging. Because right now, let's say you're doing cold calling, typical cold call script is based around, hey, you know, okay, we maybe use more eloquent language than this, but hey, do you have any vacancies? And the answer's gonna be yes or no. If it's yes, great, go and work them, right? Same with email, same with any other message. That's what, that's what the typical recruiter does to market their business. But if we shift that message to not have you got any vacancies to, um, you know, hey, Hey, Terry, look, um, I know you probably don't have any vacancies at the moment. That's not why I'm calling. Um, here's what we do. Here's who we help. I'm just wanted to sort of establish a relationship with you. So when you are hiring, you know, we could be there for you in the future, right? It's completely different. So now I'm not getting no. I'm, no, I'm not hiring. I'm get, well, it's, like, it's, it's a difference between are you hiring now versus are you hiring in the future? Almost everybody in your market is hiring in, in the future, right? That's a, that's a given. There's not, we don't need to be clever to create that environment. That's just a, a given. So it's more about changing your messaging to, to match with those people. Terry, anything, I just want to check in, Drew and everyone else, does that make sense? Give me a yes in the chat box or no if it doesn't, or any questions. And Terry, anything you'd add to that? Yeah, and most recruiters, if they spoke to a hiring manager today, as we enter tomorrow, we enter into the second quarter of the year. Now, if you spoke to most recruiters and, and the, the recruiter spoke to a hiring manager, the hiring manager says, yeah, we won't be recruiting until the end of this year. So we won't be uh, recruiting until October. Majority of recruiters would say, I'll call you back in October. There's a big mistake in that because if you call them back in October, it's now too late. The hiring manager says they'll be recruiting in October. You should be getting an appointment with them probably uh, June, July time. Because if they want the candidate to start in October, most candidates are on at least a month's, month's notice. Um, it's going to take you, what, a month, six weeks to find the candidate? So there's two months. So you've gone back now to August. So it's imperative that when you have those conversations, it's called future pace. When you ask the question, you ask them about the future rather than are you recruiting right now? Because you want to find those future buyers, not the, not the hiring manager that's recruited now and is giving it to the, everybody else out there. Yeah, absolutely right, Drew. Yeah, I think this is, this is the intelligent Drew in, in, in the audience rather than uh, Drew Edwards. You're absolutely right, yeah. Yeah, so again, just let, let us know in the chat box if you're making sense, got any questions. I want to make sure we're clear before we move on. I hope, hope, hate for you to sort of get left behind and not understand something. Um, but let us know. But so we've got we've got this this you get shift with who, who we're going after after, right? So we're going after the future buyers. It's, it's, it's a really the good thing is it's a really easy shift to make because it's you know, as as, as we've said, I've said in the chat box, um, you know, they're pretty much, everyone in your market is pretty much a future buyer. It's just, it's just about changing your message to approach them differently, right? That's a, that's quite an easy shift shift to make, right? We, we have to be okay with the fact though, um, we're not we're not after, we're thinking about the future, we're building foundation for the future rather than now, right? So this may not be, a, 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 especially if you're contingency at the moment, this may not be a shift that you make overnight because you need, again, you need to eat, right? So it may not be a shift you make overnight, but you need to be sort of putting in the work now. So eventually you can, you can, you can make that transition. Because if you make that transition overnight and you've got zero pipeline, obviously we're now going after future buyers. You, you're gonna, there's going to be a period where maybe you have zero job orders, right? And that will feel, could feel, um, I guess, uh, you know, insecure is the word I'd say. Like it doesn't feel secure, right? Because you're used to, having these job orders that you're working and you, you know you're going to fill a percentage of them right so that that's the sort of caveat i'd say you have to be aware of the shift and maybe do it if you're not prepared to do it you know overnight i guess some of our clients do it instantly but if not instantly gradually so as well as going after now but we start building the future pipelines for future buyers so we, we can sort of gradually make that transition the other thing i want to talk about is um so we said right at the, right, right at the start we're going to share with you um the you know what we call the Starbucks secret, so they can close ninety five percent, sorry ninety seven percent of people that enter their sales process. So just want to illustrate this out uh, to make sure we're on the same page here. So we have let's say we've got your your I'm going to call it BD, your business development over here, right? Like this is your marketing, whatever you do to, to generate business, your cold calls, your emails, your 
LinkedIn activity, whatever it is, you're, anything you do to develop business is, is here. You think about like the role of that. Like what is the what is the reason we're doing that? Is to get people into your sales process, right? And as a just 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 before I go on, does that make sense? You know, that's the purpose of that's the you know if we simple simplify everything. That's the reason you're doing BD to get more people into your sales process. Does that make sense? Give me a yes or no in the chat box. Yeah, perfect. So no, I'm not going to overcomplicate it. That's why we're doing it, right? So if you think about you as a recruitment or search business owner, like what does that mean? Like what is your sales process? Your sales process is going to be, um, you know, a meeting of some sort, right? A sales meeting. So maybe last year, maybe the year before it was, it was face to face. Now more likely to be on zoom or over the phone, but it's going to be a sales meeting. So anything we do to, to generate business is to get more people into a sales meeting, right? That's, that's the, that's the ultimate goal. So Starbucks sales process, think about their sales process, their sales process is to have someone um, enter their store and, you know, think about Starbucks store, you go to the till and you sort of queue up and you, and you make your order. So their sales process is, is getting people to enter the till, right? <clears throat> again, very simple. So again, a mentor of mine shared this with me, like how does Starbucks close so many people that enter the sales process versus, you know, a lot of service-based businesses, you know, they've got 10%, 20% closing rate. You know, you speak to five people, you maybe convert one of them. Why is it that it's so high for Starbucks? And, you know, the the, the easy solution to make is off because it's, you know, lower ticket or all, all, all these other things. But he, he was saying, like, the actual reason is everyone that Starbucks gets into the sales process, almost everyone is a buyer, right? We enter Starbucks with the intent to buy. You, you know, that's, that's typically how we enter the store. So what we need to think about is how do we do that? in your recruitment business how do we ensure that when you're speaking to a prospect that they have intent to buy because we've all again maybe make, let me check in who's been in a situation where you're speaking with a prospect you get on everything's great but they have no intent to buy so you don't make the sale it's just you know though you enjoyed the call and enjoyed the meeting it was just if you look at it if we're sort of critical how you how we look at it it was, it was a waste of time give me a yes or no if that's ever happened to you before you spoke with the prospect spent a lot of time with them but they, they haven't converted or they only wanted to do contingency or they, they weren't, you weren't on the same page with the service that they needed and the service that you wanted to provide for them. And Terry, anything you'd add to that? Not oh, this day's Drew. Right, so it's happened, it's happened to all of us. So what we're looking at is how can we eliminate that and ensure that if we're speaking to a prospect about exclusivity or retained, let's make sure we're speaking to people who want exclusivity or retained, right? If that happens, you know, having more sales, one number one, more sales meetings, two, the people we have sales meetings with are already looking for that level of service, we'll make more sales, right? There's no, there's no rocket science to this, it, it, it just works, right? So what, what a lot of our clients do is they have, you know, rather than just doing business development straight to a sales meeting, they, they use a process that we call filtration, which filters out, you know, the, the, the bad leads, but lets the good leads go to their sales process and so not wasting time. So, and a process they use for fil filtration is, is a process that we call the triage call. And it's basically a 15 minute fact finding mission where we speak with a prospect and our goal is to, I, I guess, see if they qualify to move to the next stage, which would be our sales meeting, right? Which one check in, does that make sense? Give me a yes or no in the chat box so far to make sure we're on the same page. Perfect, perfect. So this does this does two things. So one, one it filters out the bad and lets through the good, which is that's the primary focus. But two, you know, we spoke we spoke earlier about volume, right? We spoke earlier about you know volume of calls is, is volume of sales meetings is is a, is a critical thing here. This sort of works against that because you know we, we're stopping people getting through to the next stage. But what it does do is it makes it a really easy next step for the hiring manager or hiring leader. So if you think about, if you speak to a, a prospect today and, you know, in your head, your goal is to get them to a sales call, which is you know, effectively going to be an hour, maybe two hours, 90 minute call where you're going to sell to them. No one really wants that. If we reframe it and it's like, look, it's just a 15 minute call to look at your current process that you have in place when it comes to attracting the top candidates, see if we can help you put any gaps and share with you what's working 
for our clients, right? So it's a low risk, easy, attractive offer to give to a hiring manager. Look, it's a 15 minute call. I'm gonna show you what's working for our clients to see if we can you know, help you out, plug any gaps, right? That's, what, that's how we frame the call. All of a sudden, what, what you're finding, what our clients find is they're getting a higher volume of calls to the point where like, when we, when we um, broadcast our clients' results in terms of calls booked, people don't tend to believe it because it's just so far away from where they are, right? I, I'll give you an example. Um, and again, not, not necessarily saying this is the normal what you can get, but one of our clients, Jenny, just a couple of weeks ago, she had 14 sales calls booked, 14 triage calls booked in a week, um, just from messaging people on LinkedIn, saying to them, look, hey, um, you know, find out what their needs were and saying, hey, look, we can probably provide some insight into that. Um, how about we jump on a quick 15 minute call, I'll show you what's working for our clients and hopefully you can find that useful, right? So it's a really easy, low risk offer. So she books these triage calls and then she's fact finding to see which ones deserve to go to a, you know, which ones qualified to go to a sales call. And they're the ones who, um, you know, meet our, what we call our triage checklist. I'll just show you that quickly. So our triage checklist. So our triage checklist says, on the call, on the triage call, here's what she's looking for. Here's what our clients are looking for. One, do they have a need that you can help with? Right? Do they have a need that you can help with? Is filling the role critical to the business or department? Again, these are things that make it easier to get it on exclusive or retained. When the, when the role isn't critical, it's difficult for them to get them to pay for a premium service. So I'm checking, does that make sense? Give, me, give us a yes or no in the chat box. And Terry, anything you'd add at this stage? Yeah, a question, and I just want to think what Drew just shared with you. And, and by the way, Drew, it wasn't 14, it was 18 calls, uh, not 14 calls, just, just, just on that. But here's a question for you as Drew's going through this. I, I'll, just be, I'll just be interested because I, I, I have some idea. Last month, we're at, the, we're at the end of March, I just want you to type in the number. How many conversations did you have, or how many, yeah, how many meetings did you have? with new hiring managers in your market last month. Just, just type, just give me the numbers and the number of new meet, sorry, number of meetings you had, be it telephone, Zoom, face-to-face, -face, with hiring managers in your market who had a need for what you had for the month. Yeah, just, just, just share some numbers with, uh, with, with us there. How many meetings did you have? Brian, Jonathan, how many meetings did you have? Drew had 10. Any advance on any advance on ten? So far, we're at one or three. One, two, three. Jonathan had twenty. Awesome. Any advance on twenty? Brian had seven. Just take a look at those numbers there. As we said, Jenny got eighteen in one week. Seven, twenty. Let me repeat. Jenny got eighteen in one week. What would it mean to your business? If you were jumping on 18 telephone calls with potential hiring managers, so you know in the market what you do in one week, and you're then going through this checklist here and you're asking these questions. And when we share this information, some people said, well, that's BS, that's that's not possible. And I can understand why you would think that when you look at what the, the norms is. You guys have just shared me, Jonathan's got the highest there of 20 in one month. That's one a day. Jenny got 18 in one week. Back to you, Drew, with the, with the checklist. Yeah, so what, what we're able to do if we have this triage process, is again, we can filter out the ones who aren't quite right. Or And what we're doing, anyone that's not right for it, for uh, or retained, it, again, it's up to you what you do. But if you, if you want to completely stop contingency, you just don't, you just don't get any further. You say, look, you know, not really sure our service is right for you, but, you know, here's two other firms that I can recommend, or here's, you recommend to speak to this person, or... You know, you, you may want to still want to do some contingency and you can still move them to the, to the sales call, but at least you know before you get to the sales call of, of what service to sell them rather than trying to sell them exclusive or retained when they, that they were never going to buy just because of what they're looking for, right? So we're filtering, the, the, the map, filtering them out, right? And what, what, what Jenny's doing is, you know, some people are booking in for this month for a sales call, some people for next month. What's well, your future booking these sales calls for people? Because they're saying, look, um, we're not hiring them right now, but we're, you know, we're hiring in June, we're hiring in September, we're hiring in December. And she's, she's okay, look, we're hiring in December, probably want, want them to, to you probably want to uh, make the offer in November, you probably need to start the search in September, blah, blah. So she's, she's, she's making sure that she's the first recruiter they speak to before they start the hiring process, which is critical, right? If we get there first, we stand off, well, if we get there last, we, 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 it's difficult to get a, a exclusive or retain if, if they've already 
engage other recruiters, obviously, right? So we, it's important that we get there first before they make that decision. So if you find out, you know, is it critical to the business or department? Uh, do you want, do they want the, to hire the best candidate in the market? Again, critical. Some people don't. It sounds like a silly question. Some people don't want the best candidate in the market and they're happy to get someone that's on a job board who's submitted a CV. It's a different level of service. If you want the best candidate in the market, you need to do a search, right? It's the only way that you can get the best candidate. Even, even with NPCs, right? You can get a, you can get a, a, a ridiculously good CV on an NPC, um, an NPC across to the, to the client. There's no way of knowing if that's the best candidate in the market unless, unless you've done a search. Like how do you know, right? You're guessing, right? And that's, recruitment doesn't really lend itself to that. So if they do want the best, we have to do a search, which means, you know, it lends itself to exclusivity or retain. Again, someone check in, does that make sense? Give me a yes or no in the chat box or any questions, let me know. For those that don't know, an MPC is just a terminology. It's most placeable candidates. Some of you call it just marketing, marketing out a, a, a top candidates, but that's what we mean by an MPC and an M most placeable candidate that you would then mark, mark it out to potential clients. Uh, Casper has at least three questions on screen aimed at live role, just trying to frame them in the context of future fact finding conversations. So Casper said, are these trails conversations on screen aimed at live roles? Like, no. So if you remember what we said at the start, we're going after people not who are hiring now, but people are hiring in the future. So it, 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 it depends, right? Sometimes with a live role, they're, they, they're not working with any other recruiters, so it's worth going through this process. But otherwise, you, you're finding out for future roles, but not necessarily ones that are live and maybe have other recruiters working on it. Right, and then it's like, okay, so we want to find out, um, and again, we're not asking these questions word for word, but we're just fact finding. We're, we're, we're asking questions that elicit this information. So is the, is the hiring manager or hiring leader's job security or performance depending dependent on making the right hire? Again, if it's not, it's hard to leverage them in a sales meeting. How can we say, look, you need to get the best service when it's like, well, they don't really, like, they don't really care. Just, they're just filling the role to, to, to get bums on seats, not to you know, excel in their, their own personal career. Um, do they want the best candidate sent to them exclusively? Again, critical, right? It seems, seems obvious, right? So if someone, wants to, if someone wants the best candidate in the market, the, the, having working on contingency directly works against that because, you know, if you're a contingency recruiter, you know, you're going to find a good candidate, you send it to your client, but you're also maybe going to send it to three, four, or five other competitors, competing clients, because you want to get paid, right? So, for, but for each of those clients, it's, it, every time you do that, it's reduced their chances of getting the candidate they want because the candidate's going to have more options. So we're asking the client, look, when you, if you get the best candidate, like you want them exclusively sent to you or you okay with them sent to your competitors. Again, some people won't mind, but some people that, no, I want them exclusively. The moment you've got that, what they need to have an exclusive service, they, that's what they need to, right? So it makes it easier in the sales call. Again, we want to get timeframes, want to make sure they've got the budget, again, probably you've all been there when you speak to people who can't afford your service. Service. We want to make sure the relevant people are in the meeting and we want to make sure that no recruiters are currently working on a vacancy because again, it makes it difficult for us, right? But if all these boxes are ticked in the right, in the right column, should I say, but then go into the sales meeting or the sales call and we know before we even enter the meeting, we, we, we've, we've done sort of 80% of the, of the work. They're already, they're already preconditioned to pay for or sign up to an exclusive or retained service. I just want to check in, does that, does that make sense? Give me a yes or no in the chat box if you've got any questions as well, um, put them in there. And, and Terry, anything you'd, you'd add to that? Yeah, and, and, and the, the most obvious one, you, you, you're all sitting here thinking, uh, if you're all thinking here thinking, yeah, but my market's different, I promise you, the more senior the role is, the more important the role is for the business, the more likely they are to engage you on the retain basis. Added to which, if you right now are working in the market where you're saying uh, uh, there's a shortage of good candidates, if, in fact, if you could just type very quickly, are you in the market where there's a shortage of good candidates? Just type yes in the box if you're in a market where there's a shortage of good candidates. Uh, so I'm here, yeah. Ah, oh, look at this. Listen, <laughs> wow, this is amazing. <laughs> um, you should be rubbing your hands with glee. Let's think about it a minute. The client says to you, and you say to them, hell, there's a, there's a shortage of good candidates at the moment, and both parties agree. What if both parties agree there's a shortage of good candidates? Going down the road of contingency, 
and then the hiring manager saying, I'm only going to pay you 5% because of the shortage or 10%, does it make sense? The law of supply and demand says, if there's an actual shortage of good candidates, the client's more likely to pay more, not less. There's, there's, there's no logic. The law of supply and demand says, you pay more to the shortage. You don't, you don't pay less. If there's a shortage of good candidates, it means there's less uh, candidates lying about in the database. It's, it's, it's even more important now that you do this on the retained search and you do an executive research to find the, the top performing candidates. Again, just type yes to the box if what I've just said there make, make, makes sense. We're applying the law of supply and demand. If there's a shortage, the client has to pay more and has to pay for the best service. You can't, you, you can't say there's a shortage, but I'm only going to pay you 5% and tell me what you find. You know, it just, yeah, great. So it's, it's all making sense. So, and part of this is about the conversation that you have with the hiring manager. These are the kind of conversations you want to be having with the hiring manager. Because if they don't know any better, if you're not communicating this this benefit to them, they don't they don't realise. Yeah, and I think um just on that, so like from what we've seen, again we speak we speak to probably you know as businesses like more recruitment and search business owners than, than anyone else. We see inside of their business more than anyone else, like in the world really. So and, and what I'm seeing is you know much like you guys here, there's a shortage of candidates or good quality candidates in, in lots good, of markets. Yeah. You're already in environments where it lends itself, the cert, it lends itself to an exclusive or retained service. The problem is, you know, one, you know, the things that we spoke about earlier, but the, the, one of the biggest problems is, is we are, you know, as recruiters, we are not correctly explaining this to the hiring manager or, or hiring leader. And they think in their heads, all they're seeing is, hang on a minute, like I've got recruiter A saying that they like, that they're gonna work on my vacancy and they said that I can also work with five other recruiters um but I've got you telling me that you're going to work it, it's, I have to just work with you that doesn't make any sense there's a shortage of candidates the more people have working on it the more chance I've got finding the right candidate why would I just work with you and now you're telling me I have to pay up front for that service this doesn't make any sense whatsoever <laughs> you're crazy I'm only doing it on contingency that's that's what's that's literally what's happening right because they don't understand the difference between the services. So one of the, I'm not gonna go through the whole sales call because there's lots of things for me to get right, but one of the big things, one of the big differences that we've seen with our clients is just asking the right questions to help the hiring manager or hiring leader understand the differences and understand why going down the exclusive route or going down the retained route is best for them. I think we get so caught up on why it's best for us as recruiters. You know, we're going to get paid up front. We block a competition. You know, that's all good. And, you know, you should be aware of that. But why is it best for the client is what we need to get across. And if we fail to do that, we're not going to, you know, it's difficult to win the business on the terms that we want. Um, just want to check in. Does that make sense? Give me a yes or no in the chat box. And let's go over after you've done that, assuming it makes sense. Let's look at, you know, what you can say during your next sales call to make sure you're getting that across to the to the client then let me know if it makes sense awesome awesome so the biggest so the sales calls quite you know you know like uh, again sales meetings are usually going to be at least an hour long so there's obviously lots that go into it we've got like 10 15 minutes left i'm not going to go over the whole sales call i just want to focus on this one particular aspect of it which is just explaining the differences between the two and, and helping a client understand right so the first thing i want you to be clear on is um like our philosophies on sales is you know your job in a sales meeting or in a sales call or sales meeting is um your job is to help the prospect make the best decision for them help the prospect make the best decision for them that's not you're not trying to convince them anything we're just going to let them convince themselves we're not trying to push anything on them we're going to get we're going to ask the right questions to get them to tell us what they want and we're going to help them match up what they want you know if, if it's a fit with our, with our service we're not I don't really agree with, and I don't think it works as well as it used to anyway. Like, I don't agree with this hard sell tactic because um, I think people are just are just smart to it. Like, they, we, we, all, we all are, right? It used to work in sort of the 80s, so I've heard. Um, but I just think it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work as well. People, people are being bombarded by salespeople, whether it's recruiters or any different services all the time. So we have to take a different approach. I think the, the best approach is the most ethical approach. We're not trying to push anything. We're helping them make the best decision for them. The other thing I want to make it clear, so this is, this is specifically 
um, if you've ever used the word, you, you know, if you come in here because you want to know how to sell retainers, right? You don't sell a retainer. What you sell is the idea of exclusivity. The retainer is just the payment terms, right? It's, it's really critical that you understand that. Like, it, it's kind of like me, um, you know, imagine I'm, I'm trying to sell you my house and rather than telling you how many rooms it's got, how it's closer to the, all the best schools, how it's got the best security, how it comes with a, a cleaner, a maid, um, how um, it's probably going to increase in, in, in double in value over the next five years. You know, instead of telling you all that stuff, the stuff you want, instead I start talking to you about the mortgage payment terms. Like that's, that's the difference between, that's what happens when you say the retainer. The retainer is just the payment terms to get the exclusivity. Someone check in, does that make sense? Give me a yes or no in the chat box. And Terry, anything you'd add to that? Yeah, and just I just want to reinforce that is this is that uh, the call isn't about you, and and if you've got any discomfort in the call, at some level you're focusing on yourself. You're there to serve the client and get the best results for them. So you focus on them and what's going to be best for them. And the moment you do that, there is no discomfort because you're just going to ask questions and get the best for them. So I think that's 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 imperative. And and once you've got the client to agree. And you don't, Drew said sell, sell it exclusively. I don't even think it, you, you sell it. You ask a series of questions. You can, you can ask a series of questions and, and, and the client will say, look, we need to work exclusively on this. You don't, even, you, you don't even sell it. You just ask a series of questions and the client says, hey, listen, we need, we need to do this exclusively. I don't want you sharing these candidates, especially for you guys, where there's a shortage of candidates, to my competitors. So we, we, we need to do this exclusively. So there's, there's no sell there whatsoever. Especially for you, for, for you guys, where you've got shortage of good candidates. So just, you can't just, have it both. Sorry, go on. Back to you, Drew. Yeah. yeah just, just, just quickly then, the questions that you need to ask, right? So let's imagine we've done a discovery part of the sales call. We find out what their pains are. find out what their needs are. Like we, we know the shortage of candidates. They know that as well. They've told us I want the best candidate in the market, right? It's, it's, again, that's all important that we sort of pick the boxes. Sorry, two seconds. My two-year-old just came in the room. I'm on the webinar at the moment. <laughs> 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 um, so, so why, while, while, while Drew, 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 I just want to re re reinforce that. Um, ask the right questions. Selling is not telling. I want to. I'll repeat that. It's asking the right questions and getting the hiring manager to buy. So yeah, sorry about that. So th let's imagine we've done all discovery, right? The the questions to ask and the way that we frame it with our clients is these are the questions. So uh, Terry, if you can, can you be the hiring manager for the sake of this quick role play? Yeah. So. Terry, look, thanks for all that information. Just to check in, have you uh, have you have you worked with a uh, recruitment firm before? Yes, I have. Yes. Cool. And when you worked with them in the past, did you work exclusively? So you only had one recruiter working on your vacancy, or did you work on what called contingency? We have multiple recruiters working on it. Yeah, there's a shortage of good candidates in this area, so I always work with you know just you know, to spread the risk. I, I work with four or five recruiters at the same time. Okay. And what did you have in mind for this particular vacancy? Well, well, I always do, Drew. I always work on a contingent and get four or five recruiters. To, I get the best deal then in terms of you know, four or five recruiters looking, looking for the candidate. Okay. Um, are you okay for me to provide some insight into that? Yeah, certainly. Okay, so just come out of role play. So what all, all we've done now, so that, you know, it's the same one's contingency. It gives me permission to explain the differences, right? Which is all we really want. If we don't explain the differences, how are they going to know? So we need to get permission to explain the differences. So again, just want to check in, does that make sense? Give us a, a yes or no in the chat box. Perfect. So, you know, he's, Terry said, yeah, I, you know, you can write some insight. I said, and then I can say, again, so I thought I'd drop these down in note form, but you can sort of say it more eloquently than this. But, Terry, look, just to be completely honest with you, you said that you want the best candidate in the market and you've said that um, there's short of candidates. So just to some insight, like contingency seems great because there's no commitment from you, but it also means the firm isn't committed to you, right? So the recruitment firm isn't committed to you. So that means that, you know, if an easier to fill role comes along, they'll give it priority over yours as they want to get paid fast, faster. Does that make sense? Yeah, but, 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 I, but, but there's a shortage of candidates, Drew. I can't, I can't give this to one recruiter, but, you know, um, surely it's beneficial to me to just, you know, to work with four or five recruiters rather than just one. Just check in. Does it make sense that if a, if a, you know you, you said this role is critical to you, but if it, it is, right, yeah, right. So we've got they'll go and fill right. It also means that you know when they find the candidates, um, you know the, the emphasis is always going to be on the recruiter 
to place that candidate rather than to fill your role, which means that they're not going to just send those candidates to you, the candidates that are in short supply. The royals can send it to your competitors, meaning you, you know you significantly reduce your chance of getting that A grade candidate that you want because they're also yeah. Be Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Also, I mean, look, not all recruiters do this, but quite often they'll push and they'll advise the candidate to go with the client who offers the highest fee because obviously they want to get paid. Whereas when you work exclusively, obviously they're, they're just looking to fill your vacancy. Yeah. Right. And the emphasis is always going to be on speed because they're in a race against the clock because they're, work, they're working against multiple recruiters versus you know, on exclusivity. You know, they can, they, they've given, they've given a time for a proper search and give you a really quick quality service. Oh, I've never thought about that before. Yeah. Right, so then, and you know, on top of that, it can diminish your brand because it can make you appear desperate if you've got multiple recruiters contacting the same uh, candidate. You know, it's, it's really a high risk strategy, I think, especially for for a role like yours. Hmm. I think you know this role, this method is sort of ideal if you're either not committed to filling the role or you're committed to filling the role, but you'd be satisfied with a uh, you know B and C grade candidates rather than A grade candidates. Yeah, but like the alternative is. Um, exclusive, where you partner with one firm who's fully committed to filling your vacancy. They give you priority over everybody else. The emphasis is on quality because you're a priority. Um, they take on fewer vacancies and they can give you more time. They research the entire market, including your competitors, and give you an exclusive pick of the best candidates. This strengthens your brands, and it's ideal for when you want the best candidate in the market, you know, who may not be actively looking, but will be able to move should the right opportunity come along. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. What option do you think is best for you? Continue to be exclusive. <laughs> uh, exclusive. Perfect, because that's how we work. Right? Because this one check in. Does that make sense? Give us a, a, a yes or no in, in, in the chat box. And any, any questions? Feel free with any questions. Excellent. Confirm. Yeah. Awesome. So then, Terry, sorry, you got another call. I've got another call now. So listen, I'm going to bid you farewell. I'm going to leave you in the safe hands of Drew. The good news is he's not going to be writing any more drawing. So he's just going to be talking to you. <laughs> you should be okay. But uh, any problems, drop me an email. If you want a conversation with me afterwards um, about what, what Drew writes, you know, just seriously book a call with me and um, and um, I'll, I'll translate the, anything that Drew wrote. But I'm going to wish you all the best, and Drew. Speak to you later. Take care. Bye. Awesome. So, I wasn't speaking a bit. So, like, once we've gotten to agree to the exclusivity part, the only the only next part is to, to to get them retained over the over the line, right? And you know what we've found is the the only difference between in terms of so again just again just backtrack a step. When we do exclusive, we always have a cancellation. So exclusive with cancellation, meaning that. Although you're not going to get paid up front, it means that if the if the client cancels or changes their mind for any reason, you still get paid usually a third of the final fee. If you for, for winning more exclusives, sorry, for winning more retains, retainers, the only sort of differences or the key difference is your willingness to walk away. Because if you can get the client to agree to that they want to work exclusively um, and they want to work with you. The only sort of difference between that and a retainer is you saying, look, if you want this exclusively, this is how it works and sticking to that. This is why we said before, like the, the, the importance of volume is, is, is critical because if you haven't got the, if you haven't got the volume of sales meetings, it's difficult, you know, in your mind to say, um, you know what, even though you want to work with exclusively, I'm, I'm going to walk away because of, you know, I've got five of the sales calls this week and, and one of them will work with me retained, right? It's difficult to say that. So that's why you need the volume. But that's literally the only difference is your willingness to walk away. But the critical thing that I, I, I want to get from you, like a lot of your market's already already preconditioned to work on retained um, or exclusive. Um, you just need to change the way that you approach them. You seem to filter out the ones who are, are bad leads and the ones who are good leads to tell the process. And then during the sales call or sales meeting, you want to make sure that you're eloquently explaining the differences between the two services and then, then simply put it to the client, which one do you think is best for you? Right, so check in, does that make sense? Give us a yes or no in the chat box. And if you've got any questions, we'll do a quick Q&A as well. So, so Casper said, could you could you tell us more about the exclusive post cancellation fee? Um, nothing, I don't, know, I don't really know, nothing more to say other than, um, 
you're saying to the client. So basically, like this is what we found was happening with, with some of our clients, right? They'll they'll get any exclusive, but there was if there's no if there's no real I guess consequence for the client breaking that exclusivity agreement. So, you know, for example, Casper, if, if you, I'm a client, you speak to me today, yeah, you can work exclusively on this vacancy, blah, 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 done. But if tomorrow I can go out to recruit a B and, and, and agree to work with them and there's no consequence other than, you know, you are no longer exclusive, it's not really exclusive, right? So the reason we have put the cancellation thing in is like, it, it's just, it's just, you know, what we call skin in the game or commitment from the client. So we work exclusively for a period of time. Again, that's on, on you, like maybe it's, two weeks, four weeks, a month, whatever, it's up to you. We're exclusive for this much time. Um, if you cancel this vacancy for any reason or break this agreement, then there's, there's a, a cancellation fee due. And again, what we find is that if the, if the client pushes back on the cancellation fees, then they're probably thinking of breaking that agreement, right? So it's sort of a, a red flag for you to look for because of what, you know, why would you, you know, it's like, it's like when you sign a mobile phone contract, you've probably got an early cancellation in the terms but you're not you have no intention of cancelling the early so you don't really pay attention to it it's that sort of thing if that makes sense perfect any other questions let me know in the chat box um for those of you that you know found this useful and you want to speak to us further about plugging this into your business um if you go to i'm going to put it in the chat box but makemoreplacements.com slash call cool. you can book a 15 minute call with one of our specialists here who'd be happy to sort of walk it through with you in more detail um but yeah key things again it, i hope that obviously there's a few people on the call so i hope that what we covered today covered your particular blockage in terms of getting more exclusive exclusive or retainers obviously you, know, you may have a unique problem, in which case I'll say book a call as well. But the three main things I found that you know, are the approach to the business development, the filtration, and then just not explaining to the client the differences between the two, especially if you're in um, a market that lends itself to that level of service. Awesome. Um, so yeah, if there's, if there's no more questions, I'm going to shoot off, give you like one extra minute to put any questions in if you've got any. Uh, so Brian said, do you explain the difference in filtration in the sales call? No. So the, you know, what we call the triage call is basically a 15 minute call. You, you, you basically start, you will start the call. Um, you know, hi, Brian, thanks for jumping on this call. The intention of this call is straightforward. I'm just going to ask you a few questions to work out if or how we can help. If I can't, I'll put you in the right direction and, um, you know, maybe introduce you to some of my colleagues. If I can, what we can do is we can book another call, talk in a bit more detail about how. So that's how it's framed at the beginning. And then we're just literally surveying them um, to find out if they, if we can help, right? So if, if but again, it depends on your service, right? So if you, you, you might be listening to this now thinking that I want more exclusive and retainers, but I'm still going to do contingency. And that's up to you. So, so in that case, like the filtration part wouldn't be to filter out people who want contingency it would just be so you knew before you got into the sales call so you could prepare properly um but if you want you know if you only want to work on retained or you only want to work exclusive then you'll be filtering out people who don't quite meet that criteria i, th I think if you're going to do this i say like i'd recommend to have a firm that you trust so a contingency firm that you trust who you can refer these people to um and again if you've got a good relationship with them you can even get sort of um, some paint some uh, like referral fee off the, off the other recruiter without having to risk working the job order without getting paid. Get any other questions, drop them in. Um, if not, head over to makemoreplacements.com slash call. Speak with it privately. Awesome. Um, yeah, if no more questions, I will uh, leave you, love you and leave you. But um, those of you who join the Facebook group, obviously we can, we can speak more on there. Those of you that are book calls, obviously you can speak to us there privately. But I hope you have found it useful. Um, again, thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us. I will speak with you soon. Until then, take care, take action and be relentless.